there's several options, and I'm quite happy to be guided by the group's um, kind of feel. Um, what I thought might be useful is that we can talk about the concepts of empathy and why it matters, and I would like to offer you an option of doing a live exercise which actually demonstrates what the intersubjective space is, why it matters, and how it can be manipulated in a way which will give you an opportunity to use that empathic process to gain clinical advantage and also clinical achieve clinical purpose. So that's an opportunity where we may get to or we may not get to, and I'm quite happy to either demonstrate it to you or get two of you to have a crack at it and then we can critique it. Um, we can take that on notice. So it just depends how awake you are and how tired you feel. Um, so let me just start off by saying that empathy is a complex uh, concept and like most concepts over time it's actually evolved and the meaning of the word has actually evolved. And I'll just make reference to a uh, dictionary uh, definition which I just checked in the last 24 hours. This is a uh, definition that was printed in 1917 and the word is empathema and the dictionary definition is a dominant or ungovernable passion or source of suffering. There are variations on that so you can have an atonicum which becomes a uh, hypochondriasis. If it's empathema internecium, it becomes active mania. And I like this one. I think we should get t-shirts made for this. Empathema inana, harebrained and purposeless passion and excitement. <laughs> <laughs> so we all need to be on the lookout for that. <laughs> so, so if we were running this talk in 1917, those are the definitions that we would have been working with. Currently, there is a tremendous amount of, um, shall we call it plasticity? Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. Because um, I've been watching the Netflix series <laughs> yeah. called The Alienist, and it's suggesting that psychiatrists were called alienists in the beginning. Is that true? Is that I don't know the answer to that, and I'm thinking I wouldn't be surprised. Because it was because alien means something outside oneself. So, or, you know, not something that you recognise. Sure. And so therefore they were trying to find, because mental illness was trying to find the thing that you don't recognise in the, in the self. Mm. Has anyone else watched this series? Your plan is covered. No, no. And they called it, they called it and, and the, the, the series begins every episode with this saying at the beginning. Mm. Mm. Um, so, you, so you're not aware of it? Uh, no, no, I mean... I know you're a historian. <laughs> well, the only, the only um, reference I've always um, had in mind, right from first year medicine actually, that the word asylum actually means no cure. Mm. So if you are sent to the asylum, you were sent there because there was nothing could be done for you. And that then raises questions about what do we do with asylum seekers? Yeah. Why do we label them? Oh, gosh, that's an interesting yeah. So... We can't do anything with it. <laughs> the... If you agrees with the, your series. Pardon? The alienist. If you agrees that the alienist is an archaic term for psychiatrist or psychologist. Right. As long as it's not a term for archaic psychiatrist. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so let me get back to my diatribe. Um, the communication process is really at the centre of empathy. And while there are kind of lots of different directions in which people go with empathy, I think the common definition is that there is a recognition of sharing of a feeling which is perceived in another person, which provokes a response in the observer and that in turn can produce a third response of action, whether it's to console, reject, whatever. But it's those three steps. So we have an affective component, we have a cognitive component, and we have a behavioural component. 
and whether they are activated and something results from that is largely dependent on the individuals involved and we'll come to that shortly. Now, I've coupled together the concepts of rapport and boundaries because I believe that that encompasses all that highlights one of the issues that we have as medical practitioners, also as medical tutors, and also as students of medicine. And the reason I put those together is because on the one hand, we want to establish a relationship which ensures that we get the best we can out of the interaction with our patients but we also want to do that in a way that doesn't destroy ourselves. So the art of actually being able to engage someone in a safe, meaningful process, but still be able to preserve oneself, requires a special skill. And I think that skill lies at the heart of understanding what we as clinical instructors of students must really address because what we're really doing is we are preparing students to become skilled in a way which offers them a special position within that relationship. And part of that relationship requires us to actually be able to identify the power imbalance, the vulnerability, the difficulties that are established between someone who's come to you with an expectation, you've actually been engaged with an anticipated response, you need to understand that you've got to make adjustments. This is not just your typical one-on-one, face-to-face communication. There is a special type of one-to-one -one communication that's established because of the restraints and the parameters under which we have to operate. And conveying that to the young and curious minds, which are our first year students, really is something that's exciting, but it's difficult there are pitfalls and there are plenty of traps. Now I imagine everyone in this room has come in contact with that struggle and we need to try and tease out a few things that may actually help. So that's what we're trying to achieve. My um, personal view on this, and I'll put in the phrase there of looking at anxiety versus authenticity. So just as a side note, which is also relevant to what we're talking about, is that the presence of anxiety in any of us can be a healthy thing and can be a helpful thing. But when it becomes too much, when it becomes pathological, often we can trace it back to a failure of authenticity. So what do we mean by that? We mean that we've had some sort of emotional reaction, some sort of emotional response which has been thwarted. We've not been able to either act on it, to express it, to label it, to get it out. But rather than do that, we've actually contained it, we've held it and it's then subsequently surfaced as an anxiety. And whether that's a full-blown anxiety disorder or whether it's just a sense of impending doom or apprehension is quite variable. But once again, it comes back to our own experiences, our own coping styles and the way that we manage those sorts of internal struggles. So I put those two things on the same line, anxiety and authenticity. So as a sort of side note and reverse flip to that is that if you are able to engage in authentic practices, then your chances of things and developing anxiety are greatly reduced. That's the kind of inversion of what we've just said. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out, I've kind of talked about the point number two there, which is the non-medical communication versus the medical communication. So most of us will actually have an ability to connect with someone which is based on our culture, our previous kind of shared interests, shared experiences. And what we're actually doing is using a dialogue process which has a shorthand process which allows us to have a shared meaning. And really at the essence of any communication is that we want to have that shared meaning. So when I've said the word cricket bat, everyone glazes over and thinks, but we understand that Australia's in trouble, that there's no cricket batsman in the Australian team, and so we all go down that dark path and depression looms. That's a shared experience, and I can tell straight away that there's not a cricketer in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, if I was to talk about knit one, pearl one, <laughs> suddenly your eyes light up. <laughs> 
a very sexist remark. And I just want to walk gender into this at all. My daughter had told me not to. Now, you might wonder why the Rosetta Stone is relevant. What I've tried to explain here, firstly, the, the Rosetta Stone is a very significant symbol of communication. So what we've do done is we've taken an object that in history occupied a very pivotal point of unlocking mysteries that were inaccessible. So we were unable to read hieroglyphics until this actual stone was discovered. And what actually happened is that that stone contains exactly the same passage, but it's written in hieroglyphics, it's written in classical ancient Greek, and it's also written in Egyptian, Demotic, which is their everyday language. And the passage actually describes the good deeds done by the pharaohs, or that particular pharaoh, in 160 BC. So it lay dormant, and for the last part of its life, just before it was discovered, it was actually part of a wall. And that wall was being demolished as part of the Napoleonic conquest of Egypt around 1790 or something like that. And the person who was in charge of the demolition of the wall had a little bit of background in archaeology and recognised that this may be of some value. So it was eventually shipped back and worked on by a guy called Champion, who at the time was 11 years of age when it was discovered and he spent another, I think it was 14 or 15 years of his life actually using the known passage of ancient Greek and the demotic words to actually work out what the hieroglyphics stood for. And it was a very complex phonetic process that he unlocked. But that in turn became the decoding process that was then able to unlock all of those hieroglyphic sketches and documents that were discovered. So the reason that this is significant to empathy is that what it shows us is that if we find a common ground with our patients, and we can establish and test that we are actually having a shared meaning, it will direct us at the level of language which is appropriate, which is going to yield the best results, and then it will take us into an opportunity where we can then see certain concepts and ideas which they otherwise may not have. And clearly you would expect that language to be different depending on their culture, depending on their disposition, depending on their vocation, their pathology, etc., etc. So what I'm advocating here is that, forget about the word empathy, but think about the concept of communication with your patients. What we really want to see is we want to see that process where we meet a total stranger, invite them into a setting that then gives us an opportunity to define a setting in a certain way which will encourage all of those things that we've just looked at there to come into a certain interaction. So I've re referred to this concept as the intersubjective space, and we'll get to that shortly. When you look at the communication process between doctor and patient, and I hinted at this a moment ago, there's a power imbalance, so there's that question of vulnerability. As medical educators, we are taking students into a place where they are able to take on the role of the doctor in that doctor-patient relationship. So it's our job to ensure that the students firstly understand that the communication they are having with their patient is not just a chat with one of their mates at the pub. It's not just a conversation they would have with their aunt or their uncle. It's not just a chat with the bloke in the playground. There is something about the role that they in that actually has to be acknowledged and has to be integrated into the way that they communicate. So with that, and having equipped them with that awareness and hopefully that insight, we need to also introduce the concept of limitation. So they need to understand that while they may have a power role within that relationship, they also need to take that relationship to a level where that power does not actually turn the patient off or they don't actually abuse that relationship. The other thing that we want to talk about and want them to understand is that there are pitfalls. So you can get blindsided if you go into these relationships 
where you've actually got no concept that you've got a blind spot. And that person may be bringing up issues that are important to them, but you're not aware of them because you've either discounted them or you don't recognise them. So we need to carry that awareness with us when we go into this doctor-patient relationship. Yes, Sue? Um, I think when you sit this into this and you think about your own journey, um, one thing that I reflect on, and then I think about the student's journey, is this has been, you know, the true for all generations of medical students that have gone through. But in recent years, people have been thinking about this a lot, I guess, and it speaks to professionalism yeah. as well. Is, is there any good research or study as what the average time is for someone taking on? really understanding what that means? Like, do you not... Do yeah, you I know, know the question. Yeah. I think it's a good question. I also think that, yes, there is some information about that, but I think if we just broaden the concept a little bit more, yeah. instead of just thinking about this, you know, kind of eye thou um, connection, what you find is that empathic communication is actually a... It's not a constant. So we know that there are variables that can increase it. We know that there are things that can change within an interview mm. that can alter it. So as soon as, for example, as soon as someone introduces a point of conflict, we know that empathy diminishes. That's just a global given. Mm. So you need to be aware of that as a communicator. Mm. So as soon as you find yourself in a position where something that you've either suggested or interpreted has come back in a conflicted form, then you need to actually up your awareness that I'm not as empathic or I may not be responding empathically. So having done that, you then need to decide, will I mirror that response? Will I reflect on that? Will I confront it? Will I interpret it? So there are various mechanisms that you can adopt which will then allow you to change that process and regain that empathic exchange. But getting back to your point, I think that there has been um, a series of good papers written around exercises which can enhance and not necessarily set a time limit on it because it depends, it's a seed in the soil situation. Sure. So if you've got someone who's an incredibly sensitive human being, who's had you know broad life experience, who is curious, who's done a lot of reading, who's had you know interpersonal relationships which have functioned well, then growing up in that environment is very different to someone who's been in an emotionally impoverished, yeah. you know, over enmeshed, controlled situation. You put them through the same I training understand. program. But I, I guess it's, it's like where you know students enter medicine with a science background or a non-science background. Yeah. By the by year two, in in actual fact, you find that it all normalises. So I was just wondering if you have a student who's entering a health practice degree mm. and they're being taught stuff like the Silverman model that's yep. trying to look at verbal and non-verbal communication. Yeah. It, it, it's a curiosity as much as anything. Yeah. Um, to, to know, and, and then, and, and, I, and I, just, I, yeah, I understand all that stuff about cultural and this sort of thing. And, um, you know, we've all had our own experiences that sometimes, I mean, I know if I'm, if, if I'm with a young health professional, and they seem to be very poor on the empathetic end, mm. you just put that down to youth. But if it's an old, older person... You put it down to dementia. <laughs> <laughs> but if we're thinking about uh, training our young people um, and we're trying to do the best we can and have them intern ready, yeah. um, I, I, I'd like to hope that it's, the, the variability is not as huge as it was well, this is an interesting point because the point you're raising is that you can offer them certain tools. Mm. You know, it's like um, you can take a horse to water, yeah. but you can't make it drink. Mm. And it's exactly the same with this. We can give a lot of tools and a lot of opportunities for these processes to be enhanced and developed. Mm. Whether they take those up or not sure. is largely dependent on that individual. And we know that those qualities that I've already outlined, especially the curiosity, that seems to be one of the most important things in developing an empathic exchange, is but that you genuinely want to know about this person. That's right, because I, I think the, the discussion comes to is that we all know that assessment doesn't drive learning. <laughs> um, but um, I can't remember the name of the tool, but I know in the discussion in the professionalism group, there was mention of a tool where they put forward 
scenarios mm -hmm. and it's trying to test medical students, even pre-medical students, to say, like, is this person a psychopath or are they, <laughs> have they got natural empathetic tendencies? But then the tests get alertable, like they're, they're, they people learn what the response is that's being sought so that then they become ineffective at choosing those people. So, so if it's not, you can't examine it and you can't test well, I've actually got a PhD project or an MD project for anyone who's willing to take it on, mm -hmm. which actually produces what I call the matrix of working out the perspective capability or perspective right. taking, whether it's shared. Mm -hmm. And the way it goes is basically like this. Let's assume we have a student who's doing the doctor's role and we have a simulated patient. What we're going to do in this is we're going to get the patient to answer a series of, say, a dozen questions which have got an emotional loading and have got an outcome and they pick an answer which might be one to five. Mm -hmm. And we score that and that becomes the patient's score. Then we give the same set of scenarios to the doctor who has spent time doing an empathic interview establishing a history and building rapport with this person, the simulated patient. The doctor is then given the same set of questions but he has to answer them as if he were the patient. patient right. Correlating those two sets of scores then gives you a rough measure of how empathically engaged was that interview. Now if you think about it, that's a far more accurate measure of perspective taking ability than any of the current empathy scales that are on offer. So if someone wants to develop it and fine tune it, I'm happy to be involved. But that's the process which I think is going to be the future of looking at whether or not we are getting the right stuff done in the right way for getting the right outcomes. So within the College of Psychiatrists, um, apply this to all new trainees and say, yes, we'll have you, but not you? Well, I think we would go <laughs> further than that. I yeah. think we would say that empathic environments are much more effective for learning. So we could do a teacher versus student response and work out questions for the individual empathic connections. We could do it with doctor-patient. We could also do it within relationships. We could do it as part of... <laughs> I mean, the tool would have a tremendous amount of use. And at the present time, all we have is self-reporting. Was the doctor a nice person? Did they hand you a tissue in the cry? Mm -hmm. Fantastic, they're empathic. Are they? Mm -hmm. Or are they just wanting to get home and stop this person blubbering on? We don't know. Mm -hmm. But the current measures are extremely crude and need to be enhanced. Mm -hmm. So let me get back to my inner subjective space. Let me get back to my inner subjective space because this is the part that I think is uh, you know, practical and, and useful. So what I've actually described here is the position when you're interviewing someone. There is a space which opens up between you and the other person. And that space is where information will flow to and from, questions will enter, impressions will enter, ideas will enter, concepts will enter. And those are things which are both verbal and non-verbal. They are also based on what you inject into it as far as your affect is concerned. So if you are able to identify that this person is <coughs> distressed, then it would be appropriate for you to actually respond in a way that recognises that and possibly offers them some consolation around their distress, possibly some further clarification of what's causing that distress, possibly going into other aspects of trying to develop an appreciation of exactly what is that person struggling with. So what I've actually included here in this intersubjective space is an example of how I actually do it in my practice. Now there are lots and lots of ways this can be done, but I've actually given you my shorthand version and the reason I've done that is because I think practical examples stay with us much more than just theoretical humdrum. What I actually do is I have a time restraint, I have a person who sent to me with a specific problem, and that's probably all I know. I might know a little bit about their age, a little bit about you know their location, a bit of their demography, something like that. So what I'm trying to do when I set up the intersubjective space, I've got to actually acknowledge 
that there's a confidentiality, there's a safety, there's a process that we're going to undertake. And in the course of that process, I want to be able to convey to them certain realities about what we are doing. I want to be able to assess clinically things about their mental state. I want to be able to get some sort of longitudinal clues as to how this has evolved and how it's developed. I want to ultimately get back to the context in which they've lived and developed. I want to have a sense of engagement with them and I want to know more about their expectations of the process that we are engaged in. So all that needs to take place simultaneously. Now, everyone in this room has taken a history from a patient and everyone in this room, whether they like to acknowledge it or not, has actually created an intersubjective space with another person, probably thousands of them. And those places are actually things that we can control, we can influence. We can make those places either hostile or barren. We can make them inviting and welcoming or we can make them quite depleted of human like enticements. It's up to us how we do that. Now, the other thing you need to remember is there's two people creating that intersubjective space. It's not just you. So you need to actually have an awareness of what's coming back and how it's coming back. So this is where the Rosetta Stone comes in. We want to get some common ground. We want some decoder that actually can give you a chance of getting that shared meaning where it needs to be. And this is why I've set up this particular process the way that I have. Because what I want to establish for this patient, I want to give them the opportunity to talk about something that they're the expert on. So I will go through setting up the security, the confidentiality, the fact that we're recording, the fact that we are actually putting together a process to get to a certain point, and then having achieved, as I've said in the handout, I think we've got a pretty good breakdown there about my process. So then I want to start directing them to a specific topic. And the topic that I always choose is I want to know about your family. So tell me about your mother. Because I know that person knows more about their mother than I do. So that's one way of redressing the power imbalance. Now, the language they use, the answer they give me, the way they come back is going to give me immediate information. Is there tension between them? Is there an over-familiarity? The language they're using, are they showing resistance to wanting to talk about their mother? Are they angry about it? Are they irritated by it? Are they relieved by it? So all of that non-verbal communication can come back in a sentence or a phrase, but it's a deliberate discussion that I have created to put them in a position where they have the power. Tell me about your mother. I know nothing about your mother. So I'm going to create that space where they've suddenly got the dominant role, they're holding all the cards, and I'm going to sit back and see what comes. And if you get the single word, it's, oh, she's, she's okay. And you'll get that. And sometimes you've got to decide, well, is that you being blocked? Are they showing resistance because they don't actually want to talk about mum? She's the source of all the problems. If she'd been better, I wouldn't be here today. Is that the reason? How do you proceed? Well, that's drawn a blank. And that's where I bring in my prompting questions. What sort of person was she? Is she someone you still see? You pick your flow, sorry, you pick your words to maintain your flow. And if there is no flow, then you need to work out, is this part of the emotional problem that this person has? Is this part of their language issue? Have I gone to the wrong location? So these are all the questions that you're processing in real time. Now, side, side note, get to the student. The student needs to understand that while drawing up the genetics of the family tree are important, actually getting someone to talk about a subject that they know a lot about, and you're taking a punt. They may have been adopted, in which case you've opened a whole can of worms which may be just as, just as fertile. You can get just as much information and you can build your inner subjective space in that way. 
But what we want the students to understand is that this is a process which is operating on lots of different levels. So we're not just getting information about mum had one leg and worked in a spaghetti factory, we're actually getting information about the language they're using. She was a wonderful woman. I couldn't think of anyone I'd rather have as a mother. Are they going to be overly effusive? Do they have a variety of ways in which they can encapsulate a particular problem? Or do they want to just drill down on a single issue? Because all of that information is available to you in a very short period of time and takes you to the next level of how you want to engage. Is this making sense? Okay, so what I'm trying to show you in this intersubjective space is that it's one of the very important things that students, I mean, I think that term can scare people off. So sometimes when I'm talking to the students, I won't use it. Depends on who I'm talking to. But if you give them that idea that they do have some control about what they put into the inner subjective space and the effects of what they put into that. Because it's a bit like a newspaper. Whenever you print something in a newspaper, you're stopping something else from being printed. So when you're using it in a subjective space, whatever space you're taking up, you're stopping the patient from taking up. And what we should be doing is just protecting that space, keeping it safe and keeping it open. So that's why we take a pause. That's why we allow the patient to actually have a moment to compose themselves and to think about the question you've asked. And often that five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten second pause, which seems like a lifetime, can actually be very productive. You will often get more information from the pause than you will by jumping in with a follow-up question. So I just want you to take that on board as something that students find very hard to do. But the sooner they learn it, they can actually compose themselves around the pause as not being a bad thing, but actually being a useful thing. Now the other big thing we haven't discussed, which is also really important for all of us, both in the educated role, but also as students of medicine, is that the most valuable thing that we take into an interview process is our own feeling state. And we don't often monitor it, and sometimes we don't even make a note of it. But when you get to a point, and you can trace your own feeling state throughout that process, and it's very intriguing because there have been a lot of studies done where they look at, there's a girl called Helen Reese, who's a big mover and shaker in uh, Harvard. She's a part-time psychiatrist, and she's got a great tech talk on this and her view was looking at galvanic responses as they were measured in the interviewee and also in the doctor. And they found that the empathic responses actually track perfectly. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just a, a, a mirror image, but virtually the same. And yet, at times during that interview process, they can become asynchronous, and then they can come back into it. So maybe, we need to be able to teach our students that it's okay to be attuned and engaged at this point and then you start cogitating about a particular aspect and you drift off and you lose that synchrony but you can come back to it and if you've got your inner subjective space contained and controlled you can do that but you need to be aware that that's what you're doing so this interview process goes in degrees and it's gradually built but each time we add something else to their understanding and to their concept, they get a little bit closer to, to actually managing the, the interview process. Do you have any questions on that just before I kind of move on? Because I'm going to finish up in about 10 minutes. Who was the name of the person the Helen Reese, R E I double S. -S, 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 -S and I think she's. R E I. R E I double S. I think Helen Reese. Hey, I've got dyslexia, so they never ask me to spell. Um, is she? No. no, I don't think she is. Um, actually, I'm going to give you some more readings as well because I know how much people love reading, being someone who doesn't read. Um, but let me just come back to um, the authenticity and the boundaries and that process because if you're aware of your inner subjective space, one of the things you do start, and tracking your own feelings as well, is you'll start to realise when boundary violations are occurring or impending or kind of in the air because you will start to feel weird 
you will start to get a sense of, hang on, I don't remember the last guy putting his hand on my leader like that. Um, there are things that you need to pick up on and not just ignore, but ask yourself, well, why is that happening? Why do I feel that way? Why do I have that apprehension? Now, maybe you've just remembered that you forgot to put the milk back in the fridge, in which case you need to understand why you've been distracted from that process. But you also need to be aware that there may be something happening in that very interaction that has heightened you to that point of feeling anxious. But take it on board. So track your own feelings as well. We need to teach our students how to actually track their own feelings in real time. And because their initial presentation to this process is very anxiety provoking, I don't think it hurts to sit down and get them to talk about that anxiety. So a lot of them do it in their reflections anyway. And that's really healthy. It's really good to see. Yes, Susie? Um, I mean, I think it's, it's a bit like when I was talking earlier about black and white students, you know, what you do with them. It's boundary violations, it's a bit easier when it's like someone comes up and gives you a kiss on the lips, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And I had a, um, a group of students last year have a reflection. I just walked into it, it was someone was away. Yeah. And it was about a neurologist who walked into the room with an elderly person and went and introduced themselves for the first time and gave the patient a kiss on the lips. And there was all this discussion around boundary violations. Um, is when students want to have this sort of discussion, is, I mean, do you know of, again, apart from the black and white examples, mm -hmm. um, where people go to read on advice? Because sometimes, like I don't know, I'll just give a personal example, is that if you're in a situation where somebody is like, particularly uh, uncomfortable, I'll give an easy example of, like, let's say, having a cannula put in. Yeah. I walk in a room, I say, I hate cannulas. Mm -hmm. When I was an intern, that would make you start to shake already. Mm. You know they're already. You know they're already frightened. You yeah. you know you're frightened. Yeah. You know they've got really hard veins because they've had so many. Yeah. And the whole thing goes pear shaped. Mm. These days, I have a completely different ability to control that situation, and I have all sorts of strategies I use to mm. calm the patient down. And probably the last on my list is saying, well, the last time someone tried to put a cannula in me, I did this. Mm. And that's then I'm um, disclosing that I've had a cannula put in. And it can, but it can be far more extreme than that. So I guess my question is mostly around where, where you know, is there a list? <laughs> and well, and when, when do you think it's okay? To, how, how do you teach them the more subtle art of when it's a grey zone? I, mean, right. you, you know, I, think, I think the answer to your question is that the list is constantly changing. changing okay. It's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. um, we in the psychiatry field, um, for a long, like as long as I'm thinking 10 years, have literally had a no touch approach to, to practice. Simple as that. We don't shake hands, right? There is literally no contact with the patient. And I will tell patients that in the initial consultation, and I'll explain to them why that is. So there can be no, right, there can be no ambiguity about our physical boundaries. You sit in that chair, I sit in this chair. I have a clock, you have a clock. We're both responsible for the time and space that we occupy, right? The reason I have no photos on the wall is because this is your space, it's not my space, right? The reason I don't have family photos on my desk is because this is your space, not my space. What I do have on the window set is a very small Is anyone else in the room surprised by that? I have the little elephant on the wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the big one you're sitting in front of is the problem. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm not surprised. I'm sorry. I'm not surprised in the, 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 when you've explained it, mm. but, but I'm surprised that I, mean, I, I wasn't aware that that happened. Well, after 28 years of psychiatric practice, touch wood. No, has it resulted you? <laughs> I actually got reported once for having two strong boundaries because I didn't go to this guy's barbecue and he wrote to the HCCC. Oh, no. Yeah. But did he invite you? Yeah, he did invite me. Wanted to know why I wouldn't thing. accept his invitation, and I explained. I had another woman who wanted me to give her away in a wedding. And, you know, she'd been through the same psychotherapy process. She knew exactly what the boundaries were. And, I mean, in the early days, I had one patient follow me home from the office. And I just confronted her and said, look, there are much easier ways of terminating therapy, but if you turn up to my house ever, 
that will be the end of any future therapy and I'll refer you on to another doctor. Never came back. So you need to be very strong, but clear and firm and fair and put boundaries in place that are defendable. Now boundary violations are different to boundary crossings. Boundary crossings can occur when you do actually have a situation, right? So if a patient has a seizure, I've only had one touch wood person have a seizure in my office, obviously I did the right thing and did the recess. So I'm not going to stand there and say, hang on, I told you about this. <laughs> 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 so, so you understand that there are boundary crossings which are legitimate and reasonable and defensible, but that's the position I think we all need to come from. We need to know clearly in our mind what is our boundary and how will we maintain it. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, one of the big problems that students have is how to contain an interview in time. And one of the things that I do, and I've always done this, right, from when I was, a, I had a great teacher as a first year, and they said, you're both responsible for the time. So you need to start your interview by saying, we have 15 minutes, we have 20 minutes, we have half an hour, right? There's your clock, there's my clock. We have half an hour to actually do this. And if we get to the point where you've got your hand on the door and you're starting to tell me about the priest did this to me, that's not fair. Right? And you'll get caught like that time and time again. So if you haven't told that person, this is what our time limitation is, and we will finish at that time. And this is when you're expected here, and we will start at that time. And if I'm moving outside those boundaries, I'm not giving you a very good example of being responsible for that management. So I think we need to convey that message to our students as well that there's a joint responsibility for the time, space, and the way the process is run. So we both need to be informed, we both need to take responsibility. So, you know, just in terms of boundaries, that's what I want to say. But the other thing about that, get back to the original comment when we're talking about the doctors being empathic, building rapport, taking on an awareness of that feeling, but being able to put it down and walk away. Now, as the person predates Halpin who was talking about this idea of sharing concerns for patients would set up burnout. And I think it has to a certain extent because it hasn't been well managed. What we really need to teach our students is how to have that process of being aware that this person is having this feeling, they're suffering in this way, but it's still theirs. We can respond by being aware by demonstrating an affective component, by demonstrating our capacity to acknowledge, label, and to return to them, then we attach to that what our caring response is going to be. So we will talk to them about the options, and we will give them the opportunities to either take those up or to reject those. But we can't impose, we can't cross that line. Because you don't want to end up with a spare room full of all those people who you felt sorry for this afternoon. And you will, unless you develop the art of being able to leave this stuff in the office. And when you go home, you need to open up your own space and become the mum or dad that you are. Okay, questions? The feeling state that you're talking about yep. that you take into the interview. Do you have any ritual or idea of setting your own feeling state before you go in, in terms of you know being a busy person and yep. having um, when you're an intern, for example, and you've got a gazillion other commitments going yep. on because just you know set up concept of taking your own pulse first. Yeah. You know, just you, do you have anything that my, you my. From Look, I'm aware that I'm in a very privileged position because I do actually control my own appointments and I do have my own workflow. And that's, I don't even have a receptionist because I found at the end of each appointment, not only was I getting a new patient, but I was getting to have to deal with all their material as well. So for me, the receptionist offered no advantage. In fact, it was a burden. So it's all direct contact and it's all direct flow. I make decisions very early on in my day as to, you know, I know I've got three or four psychotherapy patients, I know I've got three or four new assessments, I know I might have three or four people coming back for their scripts and medication reviews, 
So I've got a plan, and I'm seeing between 15 and 20 patients in a 12 and a half hour day. And I don't take a lunch break because the workflow suits me. So I do that three days a week, and I see you know, a mixture of patients with post-traumatic stress disorder, patients with adult attention deficit disorder, a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of psychotherapy patients for assessments. But my continuous group of psychotherapy, I would have three or four borderline patients in current therapy at any time. And some of those will revisit down the track, some of those will be deferred to other people. So there's a blend of things coming. So in my mind, when I'm looking at my diary and setting up my day, I'm deliberately putting in a blend. I'm deliberately trying to shuffle patients so there's not, you know, 15 PTSD patients on one day. Because I'd be on presence of myself. But basically, my ritual is uh, I want to, the other thing you need to know is that I actually include the, the money as part of the actual process. And Caroline Quadrio, who's a fabulous um, role model for all of us, she introduced me to that idea when I was a third year medical, uh, sorry, third year registrar. And she said, part of setting up the balance of power is give the patient back the money. In other words, put it in the room as part of the therapy. They're not coming to see you because they like you. They're coming to see you because you've got something they want to pay for. And the money gives them back the power. So if they've got the money and you've got the skill to treat them, you're on a much more level footing than if you're sitting there saying, oh no, you have to discuss my fees with the receptionist, I don't deal with that. That's another way of saying, no, I'm going to be on the top of this relationship and you can just go off and sort that out with someone else. So I've never actually removed the money from the conversation. We talk about this is what's involved, this is the cost, this is what you're paying, this is what you're getting back from Medicare, and this is why we're talking about it. I will discuss that power relationship with them. So when we finish this interaction, you don't owe me anything and I don't owe you anything. We walk away having done the transaction. And I think that's a very important part of actually moving through because to me, the final transaction really closes that file off until we next meet. And it becomes part of that preparation for the next person. So it's literally a death post machine where I'm putting their card through. Bingo, here's your receipt, thanks for coming, I'll see you next week. And it works, you know, it might sound crude, it might sound, but it actually sets a clear demarcation of how these things work. So if I'm in a hospital setting, it would be very different. And a lot of that, you're actually at the mercy of the situation as it unfolds. And I think that's a whole different discussion. So one, one of the difficult things is we teach them about, you know, all the things that we've learned about. But when they go into the hospital, they can't apply it because the page is going off every time the girl wants a piece of them. They've got yeah. 150 things to do in five mm. minutes. And you can't ask open-ended questions. You mm. want to go and say, where's the pain? Ask them for and tell me exactly yeah. because of the time. So I suppose the maturity about how to um, get what you want in terms of information to help the patient medically, yeah. but yet make them feel good and be empathetic. Yeah. It can only come with experience. I agree. Yeah. When I first started um, at Royal Prince Alfred, I was the first ever Newcastle graduate to go to RPA mm -hmm. and I was there on my own. And I sat down with a guy called David Lacuda. You should Google him. He's really done well since I spoke to him. Anyway, David <laughs> said to me in our initial handover, and I still remember it, we sat down in the residence quarters and he had a list of 28 patients that he was just and, yeah. <laughs> and David said to me, okay, so here's all you need to know. 95% of what you do will require you to be secretarial, so don't ever lose your pen. Mm -hmm. Number two is you'll have 5% of what you do is actually going to be public relations. Dealing with relatives who are angry and not getting what they think their relatives need. He said the other 1% might have something to do with clinical medicine, but don't count on that. <laughs> and it turned out to be not far from the truth. 
Interesting. Not far from the truth. But having said that, the very first cannula I had to put in went into the vascular surgeon who just arrived back with a DVT. <laughs> <laughs> Professor May. Oh, yes, Remy. May took six goes. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 but I'd add on to that in terms of, I don't know, well, I actually met an intern up here the other day who had just started at um, Prince of Wales, I think. And um, we were talking about his term and you know how he's coping and things. And I actually say to them, one of the things I told them to is never forget to ask for help. Yeah. Because I think that's what the students forget too when they're learning. And I, I tell them to like, treat themselves almost like the bellboy in a hotel, that they have to get to know all the different people's jobs and know who they can trust and, and get them to like build relationships. I mean, I still do that. Is like, you know, always makes friends with the people on switch. You know, the ward clerk is your friend. Um, the nurses you've obviously got there clearly mm -hmm. on site. But asking for help. But there were two other things. Because when you in med, but when you're in medical yeah, yeah. squeeze. Well, let me tell you what else happened. Because everything. You know, just let me look on yeah. my medical admin hat. Yeah. Is that because I was a medical administrator at, um, after at. Uh, after I left my pathology job at PA, and it's really interesting having been a paediatric haematology registrar, who everyone loves, to being an anatomical pathology registrar who smells of formalin, and then being a medical administration registrar. Like the, the, the way you get treated by the different <laughs> parts of the profession is extraordinary. But is it? But everybody thinks that medical administration people have gone to the dark side, and they. They don't look to you for help. And that's one of the things I just beg of the red residents. Just ring me. I'll come and help you. I'll actually come to the ward and help you. And they, that's, so that's the thing. Oh, that sounds good. I did. I don't think it ever I, happened. And I actually, I actually drained um, a hydrocele on a patient once who couldn't get into theatre. And I'll tell you what, that surgeon never gave me any grief ever again. It was one litre of fluid on his those balls. That's and pretty cool. It was. It was because he couldn't get into surgery. But I, I think, you know, there are all sorts of... Sorry? Anyway, I just think it's, it is, it's, but it's really, it's, I think it's a really interesting discussion, isn't it? How we Absolutely. help these poor things so I, I just survive. wanted to throw in that. That's a very important point about the people who are, we are graduating. They need to graduate not just with the knowledge of how to do things, but the knowledge of what to do when you don't know what to what do. do. Yeah. And patients don't expect you to know everything, but they expect you to know what to do if you don't know something. Yeah. And that's a message I'm happy to share with every patient. That I'm not going to, you know, uh, the sooner we can get that through to the students, the easier their life's going to be. Yeah. So one of the things that doctors are really bad at is actually owning mistakes and knowing what to do when they make one. David Lacuda again once said to me, he was doing the night wars, looking after the medical beds, I was looking after the surgical. Three o'clock in the morning, we bumped into each other right in the middle of the block. David, how are you going? He said, mate, no problems. And I said, don't you find night shift lonely? And he said, no, I just make a mistake and people appear from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> how do you spell his name? <laughs> yeah, L-E-C-O-U-T-E-U-R. And can I just say one more time, I have dyslexia and don't ask me to spell things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, so, there he is, Professor. He's pretty amazing. Geriatric yeah. medicine. He taught me a lot of stuff. Yeah. How interesting. Okay, so I'm aware it's 10 past 12 and we probably need a break. Yeah. Uh, there's so much more we can discuss and hopefully we'll have opportunities down the track. Well, well sorry, well, I'll just say it was fascinating. A feast of ideas. Thank you. Uh, a lot of um, well, quite a bit of that flows over into what we're doing, but not with the same tags that you talk about. Um, it's really very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, because I was not just the same. On personal thanks to, to Greg. Um, it's um, it's been lovely to have you come and do this today. But I'd like to think that perhaps in another professional development. Period. Yeah. There are quite a number of people who aren't come here today, and you had an idea about doing the filming, which I think is mm. always terrifying. Mm. <laughs> but it sounds it's usually really useful exercise.